Welcome to our quick overview of the different types of chemical bonding. We're going to be going over three different types, ionic, covalent, and metallic. And if you're um, in pre-AP chemistry, these might be brand new to you. So let's get into it and see what the difference is between ionic bonding, covalent bonding, and metallic bonding. So first off, what is a chemical bond? Chemical compounds are formed by the joining of two or more atoms. So when atoms bond together, their valence electrons are redistributed in ways that make the atoms more stable. And essentially they are bound together. That's why we call it a chemical bond. Um, now the key idea to get here is that the valence electrons are involved, okay? And the way the electrons are redistributed depends or determines the type of bond that's formed. So ionic, covalent, and metallic all do different types of things with their valence electrons. And when they rearrange those electrons and become more stable, a chemical bond is formed. And again, that is some sort of mutual attraction between the nuclei and valence electrons of different atoms. And that attraction binds them together. A key thing that you would need to understand here um, is a concept that you probably learned in junior high called opposites attract. So positive and negative charges attract to each other. So I'm going to draw a little dashed line there. That right there is a force of attraction that we could call a bond. Okay. So again, it's a force of attraction. Technically this uh, rule that opposites attract is called Coulomb's law. So I'll write it here, Coulomb, because it's spelled weird. Coulomb's law. Um, you may or may not need to know it by that name, but again, the main idea is that opposites attract. So the nuclei, nucleus of one atom might be positive, the valence electrons on another atom might be negative, and so they're attracted to each other because they're opposite in charge. So the first one we're going to talk about is an ionic bond. These bonds are the result of an electrical attraction between positive ions and negative ions. So again, that electrical attraction between positive and negative ions is a result of Coulomb's law, which is a fancy way of saying opposites attract. Okay, so the question might be, how do these ions form? How do we actually get positive and negative ions? Well, they form because the atoms are transferring their electrons between each other. Okay, so in atom A and atom B, we see that atom B is becoming negative. That means that atom B in this diagram here is gaining electrons. So it starts out neutral and it becomes negative in the compound. So it gained electrons to do that. Atom A is forming a positive ion. So it is losing electrons. So again, A is transferring its electron to B. It's losing its electron and giving it to B. So A becomes a positive ion which is called a cation, and B becomes a negative ion, which is called an anion. And when you have a bunch of those transfers happening, you have a bunch of positive and negative ions, and so they all just basically clump together into what's called a crystal, and that is an ionic substance. So again, here's an overview of the ionic bonding process. Step one, in an ionic bond, electrons are transferred, that is really the key word here, transferred from one atom to another. This transfer creates a cation, which is positive, that is the one that lost an electron, and a negative ion, that's an anion, that's the one that gained an electron. And once you have a positive and a negative ion, the final step here, I guess that's step two, and this is step three, the cations and anions are attracted to each other because of, again, the electrostatic attraction between positive and negative ions, and they're bound together. And remember that attraction is due to Coulomb's law. So that's your overview of ionic bonding. It's worth noting that ionic bonding tends to happen between a metal com sorry, a metal element and non-metal. Okay? Metals um, typically only have like one, two, or three valence electrons, so they tend to lose their valence electrons. And the non-metals usually have close to the octet they want to gain to get the octet, so they gain electrons. That's the general trend for what happens in ionic bonding. Um, again, 
little tidbits here about ionic bonding. Like I said, these typically occur between a metal and a non-metal, creating an ionic compound. Um, and vocab word that you should know is salt. Salt is li literally just a synonym for an ionic compound. So if I say um, that I'm going to dissolve a salt in water, it means I'm going to dissolve an ionic compound. Both atoms eventually end up with an octet of electrons around their valence shell. You probably learned in junior high that an octet of electrons is what atoms want to get. In pre-AP and AP chemistry, we avoid that language of wanting to do something, but we will stay, say that an octet of electrons is a stable configuration, okay? In chemistry, we talk a lot about stability. Um, salts end up being neutral because they always have an equal positive and negative charge. So for instance, if you have a sodium ion, which is positive one, you also need a chloride ion, which is negative one, and that kind of um, eventually equals out to be zero. And one last little tidbit, I mentioned it earlier, metals tend to lose their electrons and non-metals tend to gain when you're talking about an ionic compound. All right, so moving on, our next type of compound is covalent bonds, and uh, BTW, covalent, literally means sharing valence electrons. Co means sharing, valent is referring to the valence electrons. So these bonds are the result of sharing valence electron pairs between two atoms, okay? Um, in a covalent bond, the electrons are not transferred from one to another. Instead, the atoms will share between each other, the electrons, and so the electrons are kind of owned or claimed by both the bonded atoms. So we see atom C and D beginning here are completely separate, but if they share and overlap their valence levels, they are now stuck together. So this would be a picture of a covalent bond. So the covalent bonding process, again, step by step, um, it is the result of sharing electrons, specifically valence electrons between two atoms, and then because those atoms must stay together to the share, they're stuck together and they form what's called a molecule, okay? For this reason, covalent bonding is sometimes called molecular bonding or covalent compounds and molecular compounds kind of mean the same thing. The molecules end up being neutral because they have the same number of protons and electrons. Neither atom in a covalent bond is going to gain or lose electrons, so everything still has the same original amount it started with, so everything is neutral. Covalent bonding tidbits. Uh, covalent bonding tends to occur between two non-metals, so non-metals tend to again have like five, six, or seven valence electrons, which means they're close to the octet. So if you have two atoms that have seven valence electrons, if they both share, then they can now have an octet. So rather than one losing and one gaining, they share and everybody wins. And another little tidbit, covalent bonding results in individual molecules. And we'll look at a picture of that in a minute. Here we go right here. Um, so going back to ionic, this is ionic. Again, you just have this alternating positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative ion network. This is actually called a crystal of an ionic compound because it just forms that regular repeating structure. Over here, on the other hand, we have covalent bonding, which results in individual molecules. So there's a water molecule, there's a water molecule, um, here's a water molecule, the other hydrogen is kind of hidden. There's a water molecule. But the main idea here is that it's not a never-ending big huge structure like it is an ionic. Instead you have individual or uh, discrete is another word for that, individual molecules. So if this is your water molecule, both of those lines here, that one and that one, both of those lines represent a covalent bond. So that bond is inside each individual water molecule. The last type of bonding we're gonna mention is metallic bonding. If you have a pure metal or an alloy, remember that an alloy is a mixture of mel metals that have been like melted together and re-solidified. In pure metals or alloys, there are usually vacant valence um, orbitals. Now I know you haven't learned that word yet, but let's just say empty rooms where electrons could live, okay? Um, when those vacant areas overlap from one atom to another, then the outermost electrons can kind of roam freely 
throughout the entire metal, okay? This concept right here might not fully make sense if you're very early in the school year, but the main idea to remember is that metal atoms tend to have a lot of extra empty areas where electrons could exist. So these electrons are free to move from one atom to another because there's room for them to go. These are called delocalized electrons, okay? If you think about the word localized, it means that it's local to a certain area, okay? So if there's like an outbreak of a disease, you might say, oh, I'm not going to worry here in Texas because it's localized to uh, New York or something like that. So localized means it's stuck somewhere. Delocalized means roaming freely. So the electrons in a metal are delocalized. These mobile electrons or a sea of electrons can move throughout the entire metal. The metallic bond, remember the bond is some sort of attraction. The metallic bond is a result of the attraction between the metal nuclei, which are positive, and the surrounding sea of electrons, the free-floating electrons, which are negative. So I think this makes more sense if we look at a picture. Um, this is a picture of a metal. The positive circles that you see represent individual metal atoms. And then notice how the electrons are not really in any predictable arrangement around them. Those electrons are literally just free to move anywhere throughout this um, structure, okay? So again, this is called just a sea of electrons or delocalized electrons. The valence electrons from each metal are able to move completely throughout the metal. And you may have heard that metals are very good conductors of electricity. You know, if you think about a wire, a wire is made out of metal. The passage of electricity is actually electrons moving. Whatever substance you're talking about that conducts electricity, it must have electrons able to move throughout it, okay? So metals are good conductors because they have these electrons free to move. So here's an over, overview of the metallic bonding process. Metal atoms have overlapping empty orbitals. Just again, think of those as electron spaces. Each metal atom loses its valence electrons to roam freely throughout the metal. And the metal is held together because those free floating electrons are negative. Let's just say and. The free floating negative electrons and the positive metal cores or nucleus of each atom are attracted to each other. So again, it's that Coulomb's law, positive electrons, sorry, positive nucleus and negative electrons are all attracted to each other and hold it all together. So just a couple of quick little practice problems. You should be able to look at a substance now and identify what type of bonding is present. So our first example here is lithium fluoride. We want to think about what type of elements these are. So lithium, so I'm going to, here's a really rough sketch of the periodic table like really rough, sorry y'all. There's your zigzag line. Lithium is over here and fluoride is over here. So lithium is a metal and fluoride is a non-metal. So what type of bonding is metal and non-metal? It's ionic. So metal and non-metal is ionic. Here's your next one, brass. Brass is a mixture of zinc and copper. So zinc is over here and copper is right there next to it, okay? So they're both metals. Metals and no non-metal is going to result in metallic bonding. So brass is actually an alloy of zinc and copper melted together. Here's another example, carbon dioxide. So again, think about the type of element. Carbon is up here and oxygen is up here. Both of these are non-metals. So if you have non-metal bonded with non-metal, what type of bonding is that? That is covalent. And finally, copper to bromide. Again, copper is over here. Bromide is over here, so that is metal plus non-metal. What type of bonding is that? That is ionic. Oh, one more. Phosphorus deca oxide. So phosphorus is down here, still on the right-hand side. Phosphorus and oxygen. Two non-metals, so what type is it? Covalent. All right, so that is it for our overview of bonding, the three main types, ionic, covalent, and metallic. Thank you for watching.